Have children, yours or someone else's, ever interrupted or distracted you in some way when you're in the middle of something pretty important? Have children, yours or someone else's, ever interrupted or distracted you in some way when you were in the middle of something pretty important? Years ago, I met a pastor uh, who told me a story of another pastor who was in the process of hiring an assistant pastor. And the way the story goes is mid-interview, the pastor was being interviewed. Uh, I guess the child was kind of outside the interview room or whatever with mom or something. The child comes darting into the interview room, daddy, daddy, daddy. And right away, the assistant pastor said, not right now, son. I'm in something very important. I'm in this interview to be a pastor here at this church. And uh, the way the story goes is the senior pastor was interviewing him, decided not to hire him because of that. And I was a little taken aback by that, to be honest with you, and I'm still a little mixed on what I think about it. Um, But the senior pastor interviewing him felt like it indicated that this candidate was not so interruptible, particularly with his own children. Now, I looked at it from a little different perspective of like boundaries and kids' manners and things and all this, but I I see the point of where the guy's coming from. So regardless of of whether you feel one way or another about it, my point's not to agree or necessarily disagree with the choice of that pastor in doing that, though I I understand where he's coming from, but I also thought, man, that might be a little too much, um, one incident, but it does bring up the question. And the question that it brings up is this. Children are going to interrupt sometimes, and not if, but when they do, how do you respond? I mean, if Kids Creek came running in here right now, mid-sermon, to you or to me, how how would you respond? What would be your gut kind of reaction to that? Whether it's your kids or someone else's kids. Now, I'm not suggesting that there's an absolute right or wrong answer here. And, and I think there may even be some flexibility or some, some, some uh, allowance for some slightly different perspectives on what to do in a situation like that. Uh, you know, a lot might depend on what the interruption is, the way the interruption occurs, and how the person or persons treat said children that make the interruption. Yes, children need to be taught to have manners, to not always immediately get their way. You know, we've seen so often, at least I always share the illustration of how many times you've been in the grocery store line and, you know, the the family in front of you, mommy, mommy, can I get a candy bar? No, dear, we're about to eat dinner when we get home. No candy bar today. Mommy, mommy, can I have a candy bar? No, dear, we're about to have dinner when we get home. And then said child starts flipping like a fish on the floor. And guess what mom sometimes does? Buys a candy bar, just because poor mom feels embarrassed. I'm like, no, don't do that. (laughs) Because now you just reinforced it. So uh, look, the question though is, how do you respond when children interrupt? And it, it, it really, when you think about it, might cause us to consider a deeper question. How are children viewed and treated What is your attitude towards children? And what might be God's attitude toward them that in turn can inform us as to what our attitude and actions towards children might be? We come to a passage this morning where Jesus faces this kind of situation. Jesus faces what on the surface may have seemed like an interruption. Yet his response shows us his heart for children and his response informs us as to our attitude towards children the heart attitude not necessarily just interruptions but the heart attitude in general that's the deeper question towards children so please join me in prayer we're going to look at a very brief passage this morning in matthew 19 verses 13 through 15 but let's first ask the lord to teach us god thank you you have a purpose for including this passage in your word And I I believe that purpose is in part to show us your heart and what our heart ought to be. And so we ask that you would teach us your ways this morning, that we would walk in your truth. 
and that you would give us the kind of heart that you want us to have towards children and those like children. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 19, 13 through 15, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. I told you it was a short passage. I'm like, Kevin, usually it's a lot longer. Yeah. Don't worry, I'm going to go an hour. No, just kidding. I'm not going to go an hour. Here we go. Our passage this morning follows on the tales of a passage that we saw last week with teaching related to the family, particularly related to matters of marriage and divorce. And now, in kind of continuation of matters related to the family, we see some instructions specifically related to children. Children, you might recall, were mentioned just previously back in chapter 18 at the very beginning. If you have your Bible, just turn the page. Look at the very beginning of Matthew 18. So, for example, in verses 1 through 4, at the beginning of chapter 18, Jesus said in response to a question about who is the goat. He didn't say goat, but that's what I taught in my message, remember? Who's the goat? And who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Goat stands for greatest of all time. So what? who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus, to illustrate that, calls a child over, puts the child in the midst of him and says, you need to be like this. You need to be like this child. Unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And what Jesus is getting at there is the kind of humble, dependent kind of status that seeks and depends upon God. So it's not just the heart attitude of a humility, it's the status of a child whereby uh, socially we might think them less significant, less important, uh, as if you were meeting with a senior pastor or someone, you know, a boss at work or whatever. And, and Jesus is saying, look, your attitude needs to be like this of a small child. Unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom. And then the topic returns here in chapter 19 to children, and children really there are an illustration. And, and, and here, they're, they're, there's some discussion of literal children, yes, but as we're going to see, they also serve as an illustration of the kind of hard attitude of humility and lowliness of status and position that God's people are to have. So the topic returns here in chapter 19 to children, and we clearly see Christ's consideration of children demonstrated especially by his invitation for them to come to him. Children, understandably, don't have the kind of status, authority, position, or power, or physicality that adults do, right? And this might lead adults to sometimes overlook children and their importance. But Christ considers children to be of such great value, and those like them, people like them in terms of status, position, and power, as being incredibly important. So much so that he says that to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. R.T. France writes in regards to how this is another example of, and I quote, the paradoxical values of the kingdom of heaven, end quote. What he means by that is paradoxical in the sense that, you know, the kingdom tends to, to value and have kind of a different economy than the world does when it comes to significance, importance, value, etc. So we see, for example, right, the greatest is the one who serves. Paradoxical. Um, you know, there's a number of places in Scripture where we see these almost paradoxical reversals of what the world tends to think. And this is another example of the paradoxical values of the kingdom of heaven, as France says. So the world, you see, the world might see children as, as less important. The world might overlook them. The world might even be annoyed at children at times. Parents too, by the way. We love them, but sometimes puppies can do that too, by the way. I know from firsthand experience recently, but that's another topic. But not so with Jesus in the kingdom. Christ considers, he calls, and he cherishes children. Christ considers, he calls, and he cherishes, cherishes children. And so this brings us to the primary point of a passage, and it could be expressed this way. Jesus invites children to come to him, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. It's really taken from the verse right in the middle of this passage, verse 14. Jesus invites children to come to him, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Let's look at three points pertaining to children coming to Jesus. 
Number one, children are brought to Jesus for prayer. Look with me at verse 13. We know that Jesus has been en route to Jerusalem. We saw that from the beginning of chapter 19, and he had announced it prior in his two announcements to the disciples that he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to be betrayed, he's going to suffer, he's going to die, and he's even going to rise on the third day. He told them that already. Remember and when Peter first heard about it, he's like, no. And Jesus is like, yes, get behind me, Satan, because you're not in line with God's will. And then he told, told him again. And now they're actually en route. They're going towards Jerusalem to fulfill the main mission that Christ came to fulfill, to go to a cross, die for sin, and rise from the dead. And yet as he goes, verse 1, we saw back in 19, chapter 19, verse 1, we saw last week with these large crowds following Jesus, that Jesus is still involved in doing ministry. He's healing people. He's continuing to teach as well, as we saw in the passage on divorce and the, the test question from the, the Pharisees trying to trap him. But now what happens is something seemingly so much less significant than test questions from religious leaders like Pharisees. You get this tough, intense debate with Pharisees trying to trap him on a theological position concerning divorce. And now something that seems seemingly insignificant. People are bringing their children to Jesus that he might lay his hands on them and bless them. And by the way, laying hands doesn't mean like they go to the principal's office and get paddled. That's happened to me when I was little. Uh, actually, I think it only happened once. I was fortunately pretty good. But, you know, and, and I know we don't do that today in our world anymore. You don't go to the principal's office and get paddled or get disciplined. But laying hands doesn't mean he's disciplined. Laying hands is a term that indicates this idea of prayer and blessing. And that's why it's paired with the word prayer. So people are, are bringing these children to Jesus that he might lay hands on them and pray for them. Notice the fact that the children are brought to Jesus indicates that the parents or at least the family members are most likely involved. Maybe it was grandma and grandpa, or maybe it was mom and dad, or maybe it was even an older sibling, but they're bringing these kids to Jesus that he might pray for them. Now, being brought to Jesus doesn't guarantee that they were literally carried, though it allows that. And the fact that Jesus says, let the little children come to me, could be that they really were carried and they really were smaller children. It is very possible, even if they're small children, they could have been led by the hand. But the point is, is that the parents or a family member, likely someone close to the family, some sort of caretaker, caregiver, is bringing these children to Jesus for, them, for him to bless them and pray for them. And we see examples of this in Scripture where, where even Jesus was brought to the temple to be blessed earlier in Luke 1 and 2, right? You recall he's brought, and Anna the prophetess is there, and uh, the, uh, I'm blanking out on who was the gentleman uh, who prayed for Jesus um, in the temple. But he was brought to be prayed for and blessed, and then um, what we see other instances of people uh, taking their children to, uh, be blessed even in the Old Testament, such as with uh, Hannah bringing Samuel to, to be blessed, and he's actually, Samuel's actually offered to service of the Lord. So it, it's not an unusual thing for uh, parents to bring children to a religious leader for blessing, and Jesus, of course, being seen by many as the Messiah, they would love to have Jesus bless their children. Laying hands, as I mentioned, was a typical New Testament practice in association with prayer. Sometimes laying on the hands is used in association with literal healing. Jesus sometimes would lay hands on people and they would be healed. And same with the apostles would sometimes lay hands on people and they were healed. Sometimes laying hands on was commissioned for ministry roles. So they would lay hands with fasting and prayer and send out Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey. Uh, and so we see examples of that. And then we see other examples where uh, laying on the hands is, is, is done in light with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And it's done for God's blessing. So it seems that what these parents wanted was for their kids, for Jesus to confer a blessing upon their children. This is a good thing. You know, I can recall when our kids were newborn, um, our, our kids were, two of our kids were born when I was in seminary. So it's pretty cool because we lived on campus and I'm around a bunch of people that are either missionaries or pastors, like people like giving their lives 
and called to serve the Lord. And, and I remember it was so cool because the campus was such, living on campus was such a sense of community. And this was our first child when Jordan was born. And people would be bringing meals over to us because they could just walk over and bring meals to us. Whenever they came and brought a meal, I'd always say, would you pray for would you, would you pray for her? It was so heart like touching that these people would would take five minutes and pray a blessing over Jordan. And then when Anna was born, similar thing. And Anna was born, I remember the first Sunday we were at church, uh, one of my fellow interns who was a, another seminary student and the pastor came over to say hi and see how we were doing. And I just invite him, would you please pray for Anna? And it was such a, such a cool thing that the pastor and this intern, who was a dear friend, uh, ended up being a missionary in India, by the way, and is now back in the United States, but uh, would pray for Anna. And, and several others had prayed for her. It was just cool. And then when Ashley was born, we were here in Vegas, and people in the church prayed for her. And it has just been very neat to see friends and loved ones actually pray blessing on my own children. And Christian parents, you see, they they want their children to grow to be faithful followers of Jesus. They want they want him to They want their children to come to know him, they want their children to be faithful followers of Jesus. They want God's blessing upon their children. So these parents here are bringing their children to Jesus for him to lay hands on them and pray for this kind of thing. This is a very good thing. Pretty simple request, right? Not quite like a test question from the Pharisees. You know? and, and you would think Jesus would be really refreshed by this and eager to do it. In fact, we're going to see he is, right? We read he is. But this pretty simple request, ironically, it is, it's not taken so well by the disciples. Look what they do. They're not down with this request at all. It says the disciples rebuke the people, which probably means the parents or the family members. Brian, it doesn't say they rebuke the kids, thankfully. But, but they rebuke the people bringing these kids. And, and by the way, that word rebuke, let, let's look at a little history of the word rebuke in the Gospel of Matthew. The words used when Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves. Matthew 8, 26. The words used when Jesus rebuked Peter for, for saying, no, don't, don't go and die on the cross. And Jesus rebukes him. He says, you're not in line with the will of God here. You're more in line with the will of Satan. And Jesus had some strong words for Peter there. And then the words used in Matthew 17, verse 18, when Jesus rebuked the demon and the boy with epileptic seizures, and the demon went out and the boy was healed. Here's my point. The disciples are not politely asking these people, maybe come back a little bit later. I don't think so. I don't even think they're saying, sorry, folks, Jesus is booked up today. Can we get you in tomorrow? He's got an opening at 2.15. I don't, I don't think so. I think their, their rebuke here in this word, the way it's used, is the kind of idea of bug off, like shooing a bug out of your car. Get out of here. Can't you see he's the rabbi? He's the Messiah. He's way too important for these little children to be interrupted. We're on our way to Jerusalem. But we aren't told why the disciples are scolding the people this way. Because the word brings out this idea of scolding, rebuke. We aren't told. We can only guess. Were, were they wanting to make more miles on their journey to Jerusalem that day? Had, had Jesus already had a long day? Were, were they about to take a nap? Was he about to have a meal? Was he attending to other matters like in his ministry, such as continuing to heal people or counseling people or teaching or preparing a sermon. <laughs> what was going on here? We aren't told. But what we are told is how Jesus responds. And this brings us to our second point. Jesus corrects the disciples for keeping the people from bringing their children to him. Jesus corrects the disciples for keeping people from bringing children to him. After the disciples re are rebuked the people, Jesus responds, look at me in verse 14. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. We see that Jesus wants the children to come to him. He wants to lay hands on them and pray for them. He tells the disciples not to hinder in any way these children from being brought to Jesus. Why? He says, because to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. What, what does this mean? What does this mean that to such belongs the kingdom of heaven? 
Well, in light of chapter 18, when we saw at the beginning of chapter 18, where Jesus talked about being like children as a requirement for entering the kingdom, Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven belongs to people like children. Little children, like children in terms of a, a low status, a sense of need, a sense of dependence, a sense of trust and humility, and dependence upon a caregiver. God wants us to have that heart towards him that we recognize that we need him. God is not looking for us to come to him and just kind of, we just need some fine tuning. Like I've, you know, I've kind of got this Jesus, but if you could just kind of give me that extra push, you know, I'm, I'm quite fine in life. I'm, I, I'm, I've, I've made it to you on my own and I just kind of need a little help. No, no, no. God wants us desperate in terms of our need for him. It's really what Jesus began in the Sermon on the Mount with. You recall? The very first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, poor in spirit is a poverty of spirit. It's a recognition that apart from him, you can do nothing. It's a sense that I am broken, I am sinful, without you, I deserve your just punishment. It's a, it's a sense of complete inadequacy. That's the heart that God wants. And when you think of it, a child can't really do stuff on his or her own. They can do some things, right? Especially as they keep growing and maturing. But little children, you know, they need to be fed. They need their diaper changed. I mean, all kinds of things, right? They're dependent. And children are this way with caregivers. And children present here, like this with Jesus, are wanting to come to him as they're being brought by their parents. Jesus is saying the kingdom belongs to such. Let's look at what R.T. France says. I think he has a pretty helpful explanation as to what Jesus means here when he says, let the little children come to me for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Uh, two lengthy quotes here from the same, basically same paragraph in his commentary on Matthew. R.T. France writes this, children matter in the kingdom of heaven, which can be entered only by those who are like children and where those of the lowest status are the great ones, Matthew 18, 3 and 4. Here, as in 18, 2, it is literal children who focus the issue, but here too, as in 18, 5, the use of such rather than these indicates that the thought is broader than the literal children who are present in the narrative setting. France continues, those who are to be welcomed and encouraged in Jesus' name also include those who are spiritually in the position of children, the unimportant, the dependent, the vulnerable. The statement that the kingdom of heaven belongs to such people reminds us of Matthew 5, 3, and 10, where the same statement is made of the poor in spirit and the persecuted. To keep such people away from Jesus is to run a risk worse than being drowned with a millstone. Chapter 18, verse 6. So yes, Jesus loves the little children. And those like children, because to such belongs the kingdom. This may bring up a question, though. Does this mean that all children go to heaven? What do you think? Not necessarily. The reason being is that the Bible tells us that all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Psalm 51.5 mentions that we're all born in iniquity and sin. And we know that sin separates us from God. However, there doesn't seem to be evidence in Scripture of very young children and infants being granted by God a particular grace of salvation. So, for example, John the Baptist is filled with the Holy Spirit while still in the womb. The firstborn son lost to David and Bathsheba. David says, I will go to him in the sense of him seeing him again in salvation. 2 Samuel 12, verse 23. What we also understand and consider is that there's not a guarantee of this, but often families that are Christian, the, the tendency um, would be for subsequent generations raised in Christian homes the way God often works is those children become believers and parents pray for those children to become believers. There's not a guarantee to that, but God in his grace often does work that way. 
So the fact here in Matthew 19 that Jesus says that to such children are, and those like them belongs the kingdom of heaven, we get a glimpse of God's heart to provide such salvation while still saying that it ultimately depends on God's sovereign grace. The, the point is, is it, it, it depends on, on God's sovereign grace. And just as God has chosen and appointed us to salvation before the creation of the world, Ephesians chapter 1, we can trust God and his sovereignty to be just and to be gracious when it comes to little children. So we don't have an outright guarantee, but we have some evidence in Scripture that there are definitely times when God does, yes, indeed, save children. And I particularly find it comforting to know in families I've counseled that have lost children to know that there is a hope and a confidence that they can have that by the grace of God, they will see that child again, as David says, he will with his. But it ultimately still depends on God's grace, not by works, not by any other means. This brings us to the third point in our passage, that Jesus blesses the children. Look, the end result here that shows us God's heart again for children is that he receives these children who are brought to him. Not only does the kingdom belong to such as these, which is a hope and a promise for children's salvation, but there's also the reality that he blesses them. Was Jesus interrupted? Possibly. If so, he saw it more important. Did he stop what he was doing to tend to them? Even if he was doing something really important? Yeah, it's possible. It, the point is not Jesus begrudgingly accommodating them with an attitude of annoyance, like, it's like a celebrity, like another autograph. Children to, children to bless. No, the, there's a heart of Jesus. I, I mean, I, it just seems to me like he's excited. I mean, I, I know being a pastor, I mean, I'd rather have children brought to me to be prayed for and blessed than some religious leader wanting to challenge me and get into some theological debate. And, and I'm not against theological debates. <laughs> I, I love to study theology. I'm happy to talk about that. But blessing little children, that sounds really refreshing to me. I think Jesus was excited about this. He receives these children. He wants to be with them. He wants to bless them. So he lays hands on them and he prays for them the very blessing from the Son of God to these little kids. What a beautiful thing. You know, it's as if they're the most important thing in the world for him to do right there and then. There's no place I'd rather be than right here, blessing future generations, asking and trusting that God would bless these future generations, that they would, would, would follow him, come to know him, and live for him. I'd like to close with just a couple final applications. I think this passage begs this question for all of us to consider. What is your heart attitude towards children? Just in general. And we can, we can say those like children, those of a lowly status, those seemingly unimportant, those who are, are dependent and in need. But what's your, your heart attitude? Because we see what Christ is, right? Do you see children as an annoyance, an inconvenience, a, you know, don't interrupt my, my day, or, or do, you, do you have a heart for them? You can still have boundaries, yes. Yes, you've got to work, you've got things to do. You can say no to kids sometimes, of course. But what's going on in the heart? Second question, how can you bless them? How can you bless children? Think about that for a moment. There might be all kinds of ways that can come to mind. Here's a couple thoughts, a couple ways to bless children. One, Proverbs tells us, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, it will not depart from him. So this idea of training, and I used to be a swim coach, and so I like the idea of training, and you, know, you think of putting somebody through some training you know, so that they mature and grow. We think training from an education standpoint, we think training from a a growth and maturity standpoint, all the different ways. Now, certainly this proverb is particularly uh, designed for parents, and parents are primary in doing that. 
And, and train up a child in the way he should go does not guarantee that if you do that, that all of those children really will become followers of Christ. Again, it's by the sovereign grace of God. But there's a pattern here by that proverb that tells us that if you do this, the likelihood is greater. And again, God's all sovereign behind that. But training up a child in the way he should go would be teaching, right? Instruction of the word of God, instruction about practical matters in life. It would be time. Because without really time, it's really hard to do training without time. Part of what training involves is a lot of time. And it involves correction, feedback, and even discipline. Yes, the parents are primary in this. But the community can also powerfully impact. And that's my second thing. So, so how can you bless them? One, train up a child in the way he should go, which is primarily parents. But two, though parents are primary, the community can also powerfully impact. How? Think about this. Look for opportunities that God may give you, not just for your kids if you have them, but to bless other children in your community as God leads particularly if the parents give you permission. And, and what I'm getting at here is this kind of follows the range from little children all the way into young adults. Look for opportunities in the community where you might bless not just your children if you have them, but whether you have children or not, how can you bless other children as well? Let me give a few really practical examples. Here I go, the shameless pitch for Kids Creek. Yes, we, we would love for you to help once every four to six weeks back in Kids Creek. Harold and Deidre are back there right now. Children that are in this church right now are learning the word of God. They're talking about it, they're praying. And, and that's not their primary place to grow, but it's, it assists. It assists, with the, it assists the parents in what they're already doing. And let me tell you, I, look, I've been doing this for a while, guys. And I consistently, in the decades that I've been doing full-time ministry as a cure, I consistently see kids fired up about coming to church, thrilled, excited, because <laughs> they, they want to go to the kids' ministry program. And some of them are sad when it's not there. <laughs> I, I see that too. Oh, we're not having a kid's creek today. So it's one great practical opportunity is what we do here an hour of your time if you feel so led. I'm not trying to pressure, but I'm encouraging. It's an opportunity once every four to six weeks to bless some kids in your own community. But there's other ways too. How about this? If you know families with young kids, Here's a great idea. Give them a break sometimes. Hey, can I take your kids with mine to the park? You can go run some errands or you can just take a nap. Hey, could I, could I take your kids out to lunch or could I, could I just come over and babysit? You guys go on a date? And we had people when our kids were young in this church and in seminary when I was there that would take our kids for sometimes days at a time, <laughs> you know, a couple days. Usually it was just a night so Laura and I could go out for a date. And that meant the world to us. Because most of the times our dates were like, I don't know, what do you want to do? I don't know, I guess we'll stay home and watch a movie. You know, it's like, because <laughs> we got the baby and the baby's got to go to bed at 7.30 or 8, you know, it's like we kind of need to stay here. And this is really cool. We had families that helped us and blessed us. And, um, you know, I recall one uh, college student that lived with us for a summer and um, really committed Christian gal. And she's like, I got this. You guys, for your anniversary, get out of here for the weekend. Are you sure? Yeah, I got this. All right, we'll see you. <laughs> it was great. We were like, jumped in the car and, you know, we called and checked in, but it was so refreshing. So what about ways like that? Here's another idea. And, and this may sound simple, but you will not believe, I'm gonna get emotional on this one. 
how much <laughs> when you show an interest in someone else's kids, whether they're little or whether they're adults, people never forget that stuff. Um, attend a sporting event. You know, if you're aware of somebody's kids and they got a little soccer game or a little little league baseball game or something, show up. Those kids will will feel like they're a rock star. They'll they'll feel like you, you're like their biggest fan. It means the world to them. Or if there's a, a musical performance or a school play, you know, you show up. It means the world to those those kids or teens or young adults that you came. And look, you can't attend everything like. I'm the pastor and I can't attend all of those things, but occasionally if somebody invites me and I get to go, I love that stuff. And it, and it means so much to the kids and to the parents of those kids. And, and I say kids loosely because again, it's oftentimes all the way up into young adults that this makes a huge difference. I've told this story a lot, but every time I tell it, I get emotional. Um, <clears throat> When I was in high school, my dad's business partner came to my biggest swim meet that I'd had to my life up to that point. And he, uh, <laughs> I didn't even know him very well, but he was, a he was an alum of the high school that I swam at, and so he came and I, I had my best meet ever. I kind of killed it. <laughs> I, I did great. And um, he was right there, just pat me on the back, excited. But what meant the most to me is that, why well, I'm getting so emotional, but he wrote me a handwritten letter. <clears throat> well, maybe he typed it. I can't remember. I think, it was, I think he typed it, but he signed it. And this is like long letter that I got from my dad, because my, my dad worked with me. My dad brought it home just praising me like a paragraph long of just like how proud he was to be an alum of that school and watching my swim race. I kept that, I kept that letter in my room on my wall for like five years. <laughs> I'd come home from college and I'd reread that letter. And, you know, just encouragement from somebody else than just the parents. I mean, it's powerful when parents do it, but when somebody else does it too. <sighs> Look at me, <laughs> I'm a mess. <laughs> I'm a mess talking about it. I have not forgotten that. So there's all kinds of opportunities to bless children, aren't there? It's powerful when you can come alongside and bless them and encourage them and build them up and lift them up. And the opportunities, these are just a few examples. They're unlimited. Pray about it. Look for opportunities to bless children, literal children, but also those like them that are in need. Your heart attitude towards children, though, and the best motivation for blessing children is to look to Jesus. Not just what Jesus says and does here in Matthew 19, but what Jesus has said and done through the gospel. He died on a cross for you and for your sins, and he rose from the dead. The result of that is that he lavishes his love upon you, that you should be called, that you might be called the children of God. Lavished. And if he lavished his love on you to make you his children and to call you children, is that not a motivation to yourself in turn be a blessing? And I'm going like this because it's the idea of laying hands and praying for children. That's one powerful thing, but there's real practical things too. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you bless children literally, and you bless those who are like children, who show that status and dependence and humility of desperate need for you. And God, we ask that you would help us to have your heart attitude towards children, that we might be seeking out opportunities to bless them. Thank you for the wonderful privilege it is to train up a child in the way he or she should go, and that when he or she is old,
they will not depart from it. The opportunity to train up the next generation of followers of you. And thank you for ways as a community that we can bless other families and other uh, others with children. Thank you for all of the opportunities you provide for that. And give us those opportunities to do that indeed. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And thank you most of all that you yourself make us your children through what Jesus has done in his death and resurrection. We pray in his name. Amen.